This is, this is a brother. I don't even know if I've told you this before, but he has a special grace and anointing to encourage people who are in ministry. And my wife and I have personally benefited from that. I've watched others personally benefit from that. God's put, a, put a, just a heart within him, and it's such a blessing. So he's got an amazing testimony. I know we've got little people in here, and I know they're going to be blessed. About, about what he's sharing. So I'm going to turn it over to you, man. Whatever God puts on your heart, he hears from the Lord, he ministers prophetically, and it's just, it's amazing. So many things. Amen. Bless you, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. I can't hear myself. As long as you can hear me, we're good. All right. That's pretty good there. So apparently I am the other Chad in the house. Uh, the other Chad was out here playing the piano really awesome and led us in spirit worship. And so, yeah, my name is Chad Hawley. I am the founder of the Nexus Mountain Network, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. But most importantly, I have to recognize a special person in the room who I married 25 years ago yesterday. And that is my wife, Wendy. 25 amazing years. And uh, yesterday, I had a couple people ask me, what's the secret? And I think I have a little bit of one. And what I told the people was, if you build your house upon the rock, that's the secret. Because what'll happen is the floods come. And they, it comes. It comes. And I'm about to tell you a story of how it came in my life. And if we would not have built our house upon the rock, we'd be washed away. We wouldn't be alive. We would both be dead. And that's how important it is to build the foundation upon the rock. Because when the storm comes, the walls can come down, the roof can get blown off, and you can be standing there naked in front of the world, and they're pointing fingers at you. But if you built upon the rock, you can rebuild. And you can rebuild stronger and higher. So that is, you know, when I was asked that question yesterday by a couple people, that was my answer. And so today I have, I want to accomplish three things. Oops, nope, three. I want to accomplish three things, unless the Holy Spirit takes us completely somewhere else, which that would be a lot of fun too. So number one is I want to give you clarity about your purpose. And I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to go, okay, this is real. Number two, I want to inspire you to have courage in this moment. It is so critical in society today to have great courage. And number three, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to give you tools to accomplish both of those. All right? So that's one, two, and three. Where's Harper? She's helping get the oh, she's helping? All right. I see Asher. Harper. Okay, Harper, hold me accountable for make sure I accomplish those three things, okay? All right. She's my buddy. So is Asher. Asher's my buddy, too. So he, here's what happened. So my wife and I have been married 20 years. This is a this is story dates back to about four or five years ago. And we were married 20 years. We have four kids. We gave our life and served the Lord. I was in business. I went and got a bachelor's degree, and then I went and got a master's degree. I was in the pharmaceutical industry, had a lot of success in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years. Sales, marketing, management, whatever. I was the national sales trainer for the second largest pharma company in the world. Life was good. Until... I felt a lump in my neck. I ignored it. Eventually, I didn't ignore it, and I went, and I'm like, eh, it'll be all right. Got a, the doctor, went to see the doctor, and he said, this isn't, you look fine, but this doesn't feel fine. Sure enough, I got diagnosed with cancer. And it was a crushing blow, because you always remember where you were when the doctor says, I'm sorry, you have cancer. And the flood of emotions that comes through your mind, your soul, you think about eternity. And most importantly, to be honest, as a father and a husband, I thought about my wife and four kids. I'm like, okay, but I had peace. And I did. I had the peace that passed all understanding. And I got my first surgery in my neck. I got my second surgery in my throat. And the doctor said, we're going to do a scan in 30 days, and we're going to find out really your prognosis. If we find something else already after 30 days, it's not good. So 30 days went by, the phone call rings, and I'm in my car, and I pull over, and I pull into a Home Depot parking lot, and the doctor tried to small talk with me. 
And I said, just, just tell me. He said, Chad, I'm sorry. He goes, it's already spread. And he said, we could try chemo. We could try radiation. We could try a third surgery to cut out part of your tongue to keep you alive. And I was like, dang, this sucks. And then I went into, up until that point, I really had strength. I was sleeping well at night. I believed in the Lord. I had faith. Not anymore. I remember being on the ground and barely able to move because I could feel the weight and gravity that this was going to impact my family. And I love my family so much that it was almost too unbearable to carry. So heavy that it just pushed me down. And I went into this deep depression for a couple of days, just a really dark place. And I'm, I bet there's people in the room that know what I'm talking about. But I was there and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why did you create me? This is a question I want you to ask the Lord tonight. Lord, why did you create me? So I felt like I got an answer from the Lord. I thought maybe I got an answer from heaven. And so I got this idea that I was going to create a Christian-based social network that was going to organize Christians into, into society outside of the four walls of the church for his purposes. And we were going to organize by the seven mountains of influence. Quite an idea, right? So instead of thinking about death, my creativity and imagination kicked in. And I started putting this idea down. I made a movie trailer on a laptop just like this. And I started thinking and I started planning. And I, you know, I have a creative mind and I, I you know, sales and marketing background. So I made a one and a half minute movie trailer about my future. I did a script, I organized it, I did animations and sounds and sound effects, and I kept this video super personal and private. I submitted it only to my inner circle of people, and still today, only a few people have seen this video, because this was between me and the Lord. And I took this video and I sent it to my inner circle. I said, agree with me, I'm gonna live and I'm not gonna die, and I'm going to fulfill this purpose. Sounded good, but I still had a diagnosis, but I was thinking differently, and my mind was clearing, and faith was rising, and hope was becoming prevalent inside the cells of my body. I could feel the change. I could feel a shift, but we still had something going on. The information that was presented to us still existed. It still was in front of us, and I know it had a great weight on my wife and kids, so through a series of like divine like setups of the Lord, I remember being on, it was a Saturday. We were in Washington, D.C. We were at this event. And we had intercessors and prayer warriors around us. And that Monday, I was supposed to go in for another surgery and they wanted to do chemo and radiation. And that, on that Saturday, the Lord said, uh-uh. And through my wife, her diligence and persistence, she got a hold of a doctor while in Washington, D.C., from M.D. Anderson in Houston, Texas, that was actually, I believe, in Europe. Somehow, we got a phone call all the way, a message to this person. And that person said, wait. So we're like, okay. We waited. We went down to M.D. Anderson in Houston, Texas. They had 11 appointments lined up for us. They were going to make a million dollars off me just to try to save my life. We went down there, and we were walking around, and you could see the people that were suffering. I mean, some of them had, like, you could tell part of their face was ripped off. They were using the voice boxes. We we're like, oh, gosh, is this my future? We walked into the doctor. He looked at me. He looked at something that we had some kind of diagnostic, the CT scan, that said I, my cancer had spread. He looked at me again. He examined inside my throat. He said, um... I don't think there's anything wrong with you. And I remember looking at my wife and her looking at me. It was probably the deepest gaze we've ever given each other, even more than our wedding day. And we're like, what? I'm sorry? Say it again? I don't think there's anything wrong with you. And, I, and he said, and I'm going to order an ultrasound just to prove it. 
or I'm sorry, he didn't say prove it, verify it. You know, I had grown up in Pentecostal meetings, services. I've seen what prophets do and how they prophesy. And I hope the Lord allows me to prophesy to a few of you tonight. But I was like, I felt like I'm in a Pentecostal conference. <laughs> like, this is strange. And so I got the ultrasound and I'm waiting. My blood pressure was so high they could barely do the ultrasound. And the nurse comes in and she opens the curtain. She's okay, you can go now. I'm like, wait, hold on. You mean like, I can go now, like you're gonna give me a call and tell me the results or go now like you found nothing? This is first appointment of 11. She says, Chad, oh, I can just feel the presence of the Lord right now. Whew. Someone's gonna get healed tonight. Someone's desperate for a healing. So she said, go home. They found nothing. They canceled all 11 appointments. I went home. I never had a problem with it ever again. Oh, here's what the doctor said. This is why I felt like it was a prophetic conference. I couldn't believe he'd said this. He goes, not only did we find nothing, you're not gonna have a problem with this ever again. <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm like, man, you been to my church or something? It was true, that's exactly what, I mean, Wendy was there. I was like, what? You can't say that to the doctor. You can't say that, especially if it's cancer. You're like, ah, it's, well, you never know, might come back. And that was years ago. And so what happened was this idea that my purpose was saving my life burned in me for years, but the Lord didn't release me yet. And this is a common mistake sometimes we make, and some of you might be making right now in your seat, is you're saying, I know my purpose. I know what I'm supposed to do. It's not happening. What the is going on? And so that's what I did for almost three more years. The Lord didn't release me. Then, last year, the Lord released me. I had my first angel encounter in my life. I was in Dallas, Texas at a prominent minister's house and I had this wild, I was like, whoa, angel encounter thing that I'd never had before, still haven't had since. And then I came back here, I, went on, I was in Dallas. I went on, I got invited to go on this show of this prominent minister and um, I was really nervous. I went on the show. I didn't know what was gonna happen on the show. I didn't know what we were gonna talk about. This particular minister was kind of like an outstanding communicator, just shoot from the hip, let's go. And boom, he has a studio and lights. And I wanted to make a good impression because <laughs> I wanted to be invited back. <laughs> and we started the show and we were doing the show and I was like freezing up on the inside. I was nervous. I was like, because <gasps> like, I came prepared to share something cool and they changed the subject right before they said, ready, action. And I wasn't a subject matter expert on what we were gonna talk about. And I was like, oh, my, oh man. You know, I wanted this moment to happen so bad, now look. And I didn't even know how to behave. I looked at the person next to me when they asked me a question instead of looking at the camera over here. And now looking over here, it was so bad, the minister said, hold on, time up, stop. He goes, could someone tell him what camera he's supposed to look at? And I was like, oh man, now I'm sweating, my back's sweating. I said, man, I feel like a fish out of water. And he goes, you look like one. That's literally what he said. Thankfully, they cut that part out of the show. But then I told part of what I just told you. And I got done. I flew back to here to, here to Charlotte. And the enemy was started to speak to my mind and said, God didn't do that. You made that up. You were desperate. You want attention. Who do you think you are? You've always thought you were going to do something special. And I was like, I think he's right. Yeah. Thankfully, I have a wife who's a strong encourager. Keep me going. Until I walked into my son's parent-teacher conference. And his name's Titus. And I walk in and uh, the teacher says, before I tell you about Titus, when he was here for this, she goes, Chad, I believe I have a word of the Lord for you. And I was like, ooh, you know, we love those. And I said, I have to tell you how I got it before I give it to you. 
because this is how I know it's from the Lord. She goes, I went to a church service this weekend about two hours from here. I walked up to a man. I started to prophesy to this man. In the natural, Chad, he looked nothing like you. But it was like my spiritual eyes came on and I saw you. And I gave him this word. I got done and I turned to my daughter who was standing next to me, my 16-year-old daughter. I told her what I saw and she says, Mom, no way, I saw Chad Hawley too. And she goes, I knew I had to give you this word. She, I don't even know if she knew I had cancer. I know for sure she did not know about my idea of starting this network because it was secret. She says, Chad, the Lord says you're to start a network. And I was like, oh, and tears filled my eyes. The hairs stood up on my arms and I began to sweat down my back because <laughs> I finally knew it was his idea. It was all him right from the beginning. Through it all, it was him. And I was like, oh, this is real. She said, you're to start a network. You're to build it like an entrepreneur. Now is the time. And I keep hearing the word networking, networking, networking. And she could have broke every prophetic rule and said, thus saith the Lord. We were stunned. I have it recorded. It's right here on this phone. And that is when the fear of failure fell off of my shoulders. Because some of you right now want to do something. God is calling you to do something and you're afraid. No more fear. And when the fear of failure came off, I put my pedal to the metal. I left my pharmaceutical industry. I left my entire career and I went all in. And I said, I'm going all in. Lord, you have my yes. And I will tell this story as long as I live. That purpose, you were designed for a purpose. And if you fulfill your purpose, seek your purpose, and obey him, it will save your life. Literally. Not just metaphorically, physically. It saved my life. And it will save yours too. So what I did is, let me see where I'm at now on the slides here. I didn't even start yet. I got to turn on a clicker. Okay, I turn on... Let's see, press down, I did it. <laughs> so, thank you, I think it's like a village. So, on August 18th of last year, which is my birthday, instead of death, I celebrated life with many people. A couple of you were in here, they're there, you were there. And we started what's called the Nexus Mountain Network. And we built, I don't know how the Lord taught me to do it. I do not have technology experience. So this is the part I'm actually asking you to pull out your phones. So pull out your phone. No speakers ever say this to pull out your phone. I'm glad to see that many of you had it in your pocket. That's a good sign. You're not browsing on your phone. And what we do with the Nexus Mountain Network, and I'm gonna give you, hold on. There you go. This QR code, you can take your phone and this will take you right to the app store whether it's Google or Apple, and we have a beautiful state-of-the-art app that serves as a tool to help us with the network. This is absolutely free, by the way, so don't worry. And the Lord, when I went to build the app, I initially designed it as a business. And the, and the Lord said, I want you to build this for me and for my people. And the money that you spend on the technology, I wanted to see as a sacrifice, as an offering. So, we have personally financed the technology because we know that this is the purpose for God for our life, which ultimately means we're gonna help everyone else. Because Nexus means to bind or connect, it's a collaboration. And mountain is about the seven mountains of influence and network is a network of people. Inside this app, we have technology capabilities like similar to Facebook, but you don't have that Christian censoring part problem so there's people all over the world in here right now that are communicating, they're posting. We have downloads in 20 nations already. We have a, a feature in there that's very similar to LinkedIn, which that was my original hope, was that you can sort by any mountain type or any geography to find someone or something that you need and someone you need to partner with to achieve God's purposes. And then I, I launched a show and I didn't see that part coming. 
and I launched a show called The Nexus Podcast. I cannot believe the favor that the Lord has given me. Just today alone, I just recently, I just interviewed, um, you probably, have you heard of Diamond and Silk? Silk from Diamond and Silk? So she just took my show. She has 2.3 million followers on Facebook. She just posted my show today on her Facebook feed because I interviewed her. And the favor of the Lord is upon it and the favor of the Lord will be upon you. So in Zechariah chapter four, when Zechariah is fulfilling his purpose about rebuilding the temple, one of the things in there, it says that the mountain, which your vision that God, and the vision that God gives you and the purpose will look really big to you. It'll look like you can't do it, but he'll make it a plain. And then it says, there'll be shouts of favor, favor to it. Grace, grace actually says, but grace, grace means favor, favor. So when you are walking in the purpose of God, there'll be shouts of favor, favor. And it's exactly what's happening with us. So I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but I wanted to give you a moment to, you can create your own profile. You can fill out your mountain types. We even have in there a free assessment you can do right on your phone to find out what your primary and secondary mountains are. And it's all right on the mobile app. It's all technical. Let's see. All right. Let's talk purpose. I want to clarify something that's really important. There's a distinction between what you want to do and what you were created for. It is a critical distinction. It is a revelation that you must grasp. Some of you, I see all the young people in here. This is awesome. I'm so glad you're in here. Some of you might want to be, a, I want to be a professional basketball player and, or whatever it is, that's fine. But where you're going to hit your sweet spot is asking the question to the Lord, why did you create me? That's when I hit my sweet spot. I mean, I was successful in business. I had, not only was I in the pharmaceutical industry, I was bored. And so I owned another business because I had the capacity to take on more. So it was fine, but now I'm alive. Physically and spiritually because of this revelation. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for you. You. All right, so I'm going to take you through how just one example. This is so cool. I did this for my own life, and it really works. So I'm going to take you through a timeline, example of how you can analyze your own life your history, and how it's a predictor of your future. So as you can see up here, I'm gonna, this is the example I'm going to use. The white line, horizontal line, represents milestones in your life in just a minute, and you'll see the peaks and the valleys. So I'm going to use the story of Joseph as an example. All right, so you know the story of Joseph. Who here is 17 years old? Any 17-year-olds? Someone raise their hand because I was 17 once. Is that what they're saying? No one here is 17? Oh, all right. Okay, so one of Joseph's first peaks in his life, he was 17 years old. His dad loved him. He had identity. That's when he had a coat of many colors and he was a dreamer. Okay, then that's a peak. Then there's a valley. In his valley, he was betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit and sold into slavery. They hated him and his dreams. Then... He has another peak in his life. He has favor from Potiphar and was leader of all of Potiphar's house. Then he has a valley. He's betrayed by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. He became a leader of all and interpreted dreams. And then he has another peak. Favor with Pharaoh through a dream and became leader of Egypt. Okay, that's the story of Joseph. I said that quickly because I'm gonna assume you all mostly know that. Now, what you don't know is you have similar patterns in your life and you never looked at them. So I'm gonna show you through his life how to find these trends and patterns so you can see what your future looks like. So let's look at some of these clues. Okay, so this, we're gonna look at clues to predict the future. Here's the first one. I wanna see if the red shows up. Can you guys see the red circles? Okay, the first clue in his life is that he had favor. He had favor in peaks and the valleys. So you, so you can see 
all three peaks, he had favor, and then he even had favor while he was in prison, okay? Clue number one. Let's look at clue number two. Betrayal. He was betrayed by his family, and he was betrayed even when, uh, by being put in prison. You see that? So we got two. We got all on the right side. We got favor. We got betrayal. The next one, leadership. How many here, by, raise your hand, if you feel like you are called to be a leader? Okay, awesome. Probably like 40% of you put hands up. I want you to pay attention to this because when it happens, you won't be thrown off your game. So he was a leader in all three of the peaks and he was a leader even in the valley. Last one, dreams. He had dreams all throughout his life. It was a consistency and it was another trend. Now watch this. For those of you that raise your hand, that 40% that feel like you're gonna be leaders, when you do this own, and I'll show you how to do it later, but when you do this own peaks and valleys timeline of your own life, this is what you're gonna see if you're called to be a leader. Look on the right. If you are called to be a leader, you will have the favor of God. You will be betrayed when you are a leader in order for you to fulfill your dreams. We don't look at this stuff. We just think, oh, happenstance. But if you do, and you use the biblical standard to analyze your life, when the betrayal comes, and when the valleys come, you're like, oh, I know what this is. And you don't have to flip out. Now, I'm gonna try an exercise with you. In just a second, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And on the slide, there's gonna be a big word. So let's say the word is strawberry, okay? I want you to say out loud, as soon as you read the word, when you go, strawberry, can you do that for me? This is active participation. I didn't get much of a yes. All right. All right, you ready? I want to hear it because I'm curious. Here we go. Y'all messing with your own minds on this one, aren't you? All right. I just, about half of you said, I am nowhere. And some of you said, I am now here. It's the same thing, but there's a huge difference. So here's what happens. This is part of the revelation, is this. I'm going to go to the next slide. Here's the problem we have as Christians. When we are in the valley, we often say, I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere. It's not true if you're believers. Now, when you see the hell that might be going on around you and you've built your house upon the rock, you just say to yourself, I'm just, I'm just now here. I'm just now here. But as you can see in Joseph's timeline, he never stayed in that valley. The only thing permanent is your eternal soul. The things here on earth will always change. And you need to have the mindset that I'm just now here. And if you have this mindset, you'll eventually come up out of the valley into maybe another peak. And when these trials come, and the more you get older, they won't affect you as much. And for those of you that are young, you're teenagers, this is really good to grasp right now. Because when the flood comes, you can say, wait, I, I heard once, I'm just now here. It's, it's, I'm just now here. Lord, I am here. I'm here, Lord. What is it that you're trying to teach me? Or even, it, 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 I'm not saying implying that's even the Lord doing it. What I do know is he's with you. There's lots of ways to get into a valley. Some of it's self-induced. Some of it isn't. Some of it is a flat-out spiritual warfare that we're in. But our mindset should always be, uh-uh, hold on, this isn't the end. The end is the end, and he determines the end in my life. 
So this is one thing I really want you to grasp is even when you're down there, I am now here. And that is how you analyze your past to predict your future. So I have another question for you. Another clue to help you determine what you want to be and what God's purpose is for your life is ask yourself, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, on, on, on my show, I got to interview, uh, his name's Dr. Mark Sherwood. He ran for governor of Oklahoma last year. I randomly asked him this question on my show. I, I oftentimes ask this question because I get to see where they are now and see, and I'll tell you why I asked this because I'm going to show you this next slide in a second. And he like immediately jumped into an answer. He said, Chad, when I was little, Harper's age, he said, I was in school and the teacher said, I want you to write down on a piece of paper what you want to be when you grow up. And I want you to say, I'm going to be a, and then put it in there. Now, it just so happened, he wrote down, I, I will be a professional baseball player. He wrote it on a piece of paper, and she said, I want you to hold on to this. So he did. Now, this guy, <laughs> there's anything this guy can't do, but he held on to it, and he said he never really got great at baseball, but he played baseball. He played baseball in high school, got a little bit better, played a little bit in college, and uh, when he was 16, well, he was 16 years old, he, he took that piece of paper, he put it in his wallet, because now he had a driver's license, and never saw it again. And then years later, he was in Australia playing professional baseball. And he said, Chad, I'll never forget one time I was sitting in the dugout. And in the dugout, I pulled out my driver's license, and this weathered piece of paper fell out. And I looked at the piece of paper, and it said, I will be a professional baseball player. And he said he started crying. See, even when we're young, and I'm glad there's young people in here, even when you're young, God gives us clues. And he gives you clues when you're little. So for example, what clues did you have? So I was having dinner with someone, and we're sitting around the table, probably like 10, 12 of us. And I asked her, what does she want to be when she grows up? And she says, you know, she said she wanted to be a singer. She goes, Chad, I used to do this thing. I used to run around the house and I have the salt and, uh, salt and pepper shaker and I used to use them as microphones and I would sing into them. And she just thought that was normal. And I said, watch this. I said, who here at this table used to go around singing into the salt and pepper shaker? Oh, you did? All right, we got one. All right, we got two. Well, no one at the table did because it wasn't unique to them. And God gives you unique clues. So if you're right now, if you're struggling with your identity, I ask you, what did you want to be when you grew up and what was the unique clues? For me, it was, uh, I wanted to be a professional sports broadcaster. And the clues for me is I used to self-record myself doing games. Like back then it was tape recorder. And I would be like, and he's to the 20, he's to the 10, five, touchdown, Chad Holy. I threw my name in every game. I was always a winner. And I never really did that, even though I went and got a degree in communication, but at 46 years old, I started my own show and the Lord's blessing it and there's favor upon it. So that was, if, if you're struggling with it, I want to give you that clue. All right. So that's purpose. That's, we're accomplishing purpose. The next thing is we need to have courage right now in order to fulfill our purpose. The people in these seats need you. The people out there need you. The Lord needs you. Now is the time. You were created right now. It's not time to be lazy. So just to make sure you guys are all paying attention, uh, I want to do an exercise with you. I want everyone to take their hands like this. And I want you to clasp them together. I want you to finger lock your fingers. Okay? Now, if your right thumb is on top of your left thumb, I want you to stand up. It's about 50%. It's pretty good. Bet you didn't know that, did you? Well, what you don't know is the people standing, you are much smarter and have higher IQ than the people who are sitting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's the other way around. All right, you can sit down. I was actually going to say you're the ones that have courage. <laughs> so 
it's really important to have courage right now in the time that we're in. And I wanna share a couple examples why that's important. But first of all, because the scripture says so. This is a really important verse I want you to get. This is taken from Revelations 21.8. It says, but the cowardly. So this verse is about to list sins that send you to the lake of fire. The cowardly? They go to the lake of fire? It's grouped in with unbelieving, abominable, murders, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. I guess we want to emphasize all for some reason. Shall have their part in the lake of fire. That means it's a sin to be a coward. Uh oh. Now, I'm not suggesting you go pick a fight. What I'm suggesting is, is don't be afraid. There's a difference. And when God tells you to do something, you do it. In Ecclesiastes, it says, this is the sum of the matter is that you obey. And if you're a coward and not obey, that's where you're in trouble. So one of the things that I, I'll give you a little tip that I do in order to have great courage and that is, I say this simple prayer that says, Father, show me what you're doing. And I took this from the Bible where Jesus, they wanted to stone Jesus because he healed an impotent man on the Sabbath. And he says, I only do what I see my father do. And when I analyzed the scripture, I was like, did that mean that, that Jesus already saw something? So then that's why he did it. And he knew he was in alignment with God. So if I too could see something ahead of time, then I could become an alignment and I could have great courage to do it if I already saw it. So I'm gonna give you a little tip on how when you approach a situation to how to have courage in that moment is pray, Father, show me what you're doing. I'm gonna tell this story because Luke likes it. <laughs> um, so what, not, not too long ago, a couple, couple months ago, I walked into a restaurant and I'm sitting there with my wife and my son, Titus, he's 12 years old. And I'm just on fire in this moment. I'm like, fire, whoa, whoa, fire in a restaurant. I just felt this like, ah. And I told Wendy, I said, I feel like standing up in the restaurant and just saying something. <laughs> just shouting something about God. Busy restaurant. And she ignored me. Because <laughs> she knew not to encourage me too much. And I just had this unction to do it. I was like, oh boy, I'm afraid. But at the same time, I just got to let it out like a lion. So we get up, we finish our meal, we're heading our way out, and I find myself going, uh-oh. And I'm standing in the middle of the restaurant. And I said, does anyone here need prayer for healing? And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> I was like, what did I just do? It just came out. Nothing. The whole restaurant. I look around. Some people kind of like, What? And so I do it again. Does anyone here need prayer for healing? I didn't hold back. I thought, well, if I do it again, maybe someone will say something. <laughs> Nothing. In fact, I started getting dirty looks this time. I had those people in their mask and they're like, eh. I always remember that part. They, they didn't say, eh. I just assume they're eh, in their mind. And I'm like, oh man. Wendy had walked farther to the door. <laughs> she had really distanced herself from me. So I'm standing alone in the restaurant. I even looked over at the guy that was sitting at the handicap table. I, I did a little nod at him. I literally did. I was like, because I wanted to be right. And I said, does anyone here need prayer for healing? Nothing. I was like, okay, bless you. And I did what I, I was like, oh, man. And we get to the door and we walk out the door. My 12-year-old son says, dad, quick, get in the car. And we're heading towards the car. It's raining outside. And all of a sudden, the door of the restaurant opens up. And this African-American lady, she goes, sir, sir, stop. And I look back at her and I said, it's you, isn't it? She puts her hands to her chest. She says, it's me. It's me. And I said, what is it? And she goes, it's my breast. I said, cancer? She said, yeah. 
And I said, I raised my hand like I was in a Pentecostal service. I said, do you know who healed me of cancer? And right there on the sidewalk, when people are walking by, we pray and we break the spirit of fear off of her. And I said, fear, go. And she goes, yes, fear, go. You could tell she was so afraid. She goes, fear, go. Fear, go. In her own words, it was so precious. Because the Father had revealed ahead of time something that was happening, and I positioned my heart to be obedient. And today in society, we have to have courage. So what we're doing, even in the Nexus Mountain Network, we are going for it. This is another story of courage. This will be my last story. So a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we, we, my wife, Mama Bear, Wendy, uncovered um, I'm going to have to have you re- read between the lines a little bit here, adults. Some really bad, bad content being actively promoted in our local high school. Real bad. Not just slipping through the cracks kind, but active promotion of this stuff. So because of one of the things we want to do in Nexus, we have three pillars. We have connect together, learn together, and achieve together. We were ready to achieve because we were already connected and because we knew who was who in the city, we got media involved, we got government involved, we got education involved and family involved. In 48 hours, we had an end to that initiative in the high school. Amen. And then a group of us went to Charlotte. And if you've ever been to the school board meeting, it's a nice big auditorium, and there was a bunch of people there, and a bunch of us went to give our fiery two-minute speeches. And we are so persistent that this is what God wants to do. He wants us to protect our children. And we were to say, enough is enough. We're not just going to complain about it. We're going to rally together, unify, have God command his blessing, and cause change. They actually knew we were coming. They knew we were bringing the fire. Because they announced in the meeting they were putting together, in the city of Charlotte, they were putting together a brand new committee, the citywide committee, just to deal with this issue because of what we did in Nexus. This is achieving God's purposes. We have to stand up. We have to have the courage to say, here am I, send me. We have to know our part. We don't have to do it by ourselves. We don't have to do it alone. This is why God called us to build the Nexus Mountain Network. So I told you that I was going to give you the third thing. Harper, you keeping track for me? So I was going to tell you about clarity about purpose. I was going to tell you about, inspire you to have courage, and I was going to give you tools to do it. The first tool I want to bring to your attention is when, is I wrote a book. We just launched it. It's called Purpose Will Save Your Life. How to find your purpose and what steps to take right now. So when I was a national sales trainer of the second largest pharma company in the world, I had lots of experience to build training programs and things like that, which the Lord all used for this moment. And so I wrote, I used my skills, my stories. There's some outrageous testimonies in here. We use technology in here where we have QR codes to take you to either a worksheet or a plan or even like, for example, we have a story, uh, you know, of like someone's eyes being healed of blindness. And some people might read in a book and go, huh, all right. <sighs> no, we put it in video format so you QR code and take you right to see it for yourself. Those types of things and how to actually do things. So a little bit of what I shared tonight is one of the chapters. And it takes you through that. So um, that's the first tool that we have to help you do it. So my wife, Wendy, will be back there at the end tonight uh, if you want to get a copy of the book. The second thing is that we want to connect you to the people. So this June 17th, we're having a citywide Nexus Summit. One of the things that we do in Nexus, we have a lot of, like we get together about every six weeks and we kind of talk and we collaborate and, and then we get things done and just sometimes it's socialization, sometimes it's the fire comes. So we've had a meeting where just total fire Pentecostal thing kind of happens. But this is a very intentional, formal meeting that we're having on June 17th. Wendy, can you kind of help with that? And so this is really, really neat. So we are doing things Very, very differently. So much so, we're not having any long presentations like I just gave just now. We're actually holding people to 10 minutes. We're having something called Cliff Notes, which is our version of a TED Talk. And we're bringing in 
a leader from every mountain. We have a, a news anchor coming in for media, for example. Uh, if you want to meet Dr. Sherwood, who I interviewed, he's coming in from Oklahoma. We have an influencer in Washington, D.C. coming in um, that she is representing the Religion Mountain, Family Mountain. We have uh, people in government. And we also have a local pastor's panel that they're coming in to help encourage and to share wisdom with us. We're going to be networking with one another. We're offering a professional uh, headshot. So if you don't have a headshot, you can come in very affordably, get a headshot. Uh, what else is up there? We have a graffiti board. We have podcast teams. You can get interviewed. Oh, I'm on a different slide. What else did I miss? We'll be brainstorming. Oh, here's the other thing. We're so interested in sowing into the next generation. We're not interested in old people talking to old people. So much so that if you're 25 years or younger, you get in free. Not only do you get in free, we're actually putting two 20-year-olds on the platform. We're not messing around. They have something to say, and we want to help them do it. And so we're going to be launching something called the Nexus Epic, which is specifically targeted to like maybe 18 to 25-year-olds. I say age appropriate for this event would be 16 years old, be fine. Because we want, we want to touch the young people and minister to them and bless them and support them. So you can do this. Um, I think we're, we're sending out little things, a QR code, if you wanted to sign up to join us so that you can have access to all these tools, all these people to collaborate to achieve God's purposes in society. Now is the time, you guys. This is the time. All right, I want to close with this. I want to say a couple things to a couple people. Uh, I want to say uh, to this gentleman here, um, has his head down for a minute, um, the black shirt. Um, this story, this timeline of Joseph, and we talked about leadership. God's called you to be a leader and you're, you are a leader. And a leader experiences opposition, but you are built for the long haul. And I just pray that a new thing will even open in your life that you didn't know that you were hoping for that will actually come to fruition for your life. Um, the... Um, lady there in the white shirt with the blonde hair? Yes. Um, I actually saw you in worship. I was standing up there and I just said, Lord, who do you want to say something to? Uh, you're one of the people. And I saw you um, being a creative person and having like a, a, I don't want to call it an interior designer as much, but like this, I actually saw this roll of black carpet roll out in front of you. And when you see, like if I, if we, many people in here go, black's bad but that's not what's going on. God is going to use you in different situations that are not normal to everyone else. And you're going to see a dark situation and you're going to be satisfied because you have the solution that others don't have and you will step onto that carpet into that space and be used of God. Okay. My time is up, but I want to do this. I want to offer something to you guys as well. Uh, Wendy will be back there with the book um, to help. But I want to pray for people because I feel like one thing I can give you an impartation with is courage. I stood up, I can't tell you how many different ways to different things, including the pharmaceutical industry. And the Lord's backed me up. So um, I don't know if there's any kind of light music or something that can be thrown on her for a minute. Um, if you want prayer for courage, there was also someone here that um, uh, when I spoke er earlier and I said the Lord's going to heal someone tonight, if that resonated with you in that moment, I want you to come up here if you don't mind. I'd love to, love to pray for you. I'm going to ask the Lord to give you what he gave me. And it was a way out. If you're struggling with fear, and fear is holding you back, fear of man, fear of failure. Maybe you don't really call it that, but now you're sitting here going, I think I do have fear. I think I do. Come on up. Any chance there's a Rebecca here? Yes? There is a Rebecca? You're Rebecca? The Lord told me there was gonna be a Rebecca here tonight. I already have this pulled up on my phone. Is there anyone else, Rebecca? Just you. 
Thank you, Lord. I almost see, I almost didn't say that name out of fear myself. See? And you know what? That's the thing. I'm glad I said that because you can't be afraid to fail. And even if you do fail, who cares? You learn something. Um, Rebecca, I had to actually look this up. I wanted to find out what does the name Rebecca mean? And I felt like there was something, before I even looked it up, I felt like there was something to do with the family. And that the Rebecca actually says to tie or secure. And that you are the one that's holding it together. Does that mean something to you? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. The Lord sees the work that you've done. It's not in vain. Rebecca, it's not in vain. You have sown into really good ground that he will water. He will bring up. He will restore. He will answer your prayers. He sees your tears. He sees you in the closet. See, the best thing about a word is that the same word that came to me from the school teacher changed my life. And when you know, oh my goodness, oh my God, he knows me. That's the most powerful thing of a word. You almost can forget what was said because you're like, oh, <laughs> what? There's no way. I asked the Lord before I came here tonight, I said, Lord, use me, please use me to change someone's life. That was my prayer. Uh, Wendy, uh, while you're standing, well, okay. So, Lord, I thank you right now for Rebecca. I thank you, Lord, that you are changing her life tonight. Today is a new day. And Lord, that she will never forget this moment. And she, Rebecca, you are actually going to stand before others and you're going to tell your story. Just like I am right now. Luke, I'm not sure how to wrap this up, but I want to come down and pray. And I didn't want to just stand here. <laughs> if you can help me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Holy Spirit is here. There is, a, there is a grace on Brother Chad to just connect faith with yours and release courage and push back fear. And I, I really bear witness that I just sense there's a grace here for purpose. And so if, if you're here and you're just sensing the presence of the Lord, I, I want to let you know you can hang out. Chad's going to come down. He's going to be, begin to minister. But you can stay in your seat or you can come to the altar. And I, I just, I believe God's wanting to encounter some people right now and reveal purpose. And you may just start working through the timeline in your own life for a moment. Or you may just say, Lord, I just, just show me. But I believe he's, he's wanting to break into some people's lives and bring some revelation right now. So I want to encourage you, if you sense that to you, just to linger, we are going to dismiss the service. We're gonna we're gonna close things out. I know we got little people that are that maybe reaching the end, and so we're gonna we're gonna dismiss the service and release you. But absolutely, feel free to stay in the presence of the Lord, and feel free to linger. Even uh, if you'd like prayer, as Chad said, you can slip up here. So I was standing here, thank you, Luke, and I felt like the Lord highlighted this woman here that she was up here for healing. So I, I skipped and I went right to her. And she said, I'm here because I'm standing in proxy. Is your son? His son-in-law had the exact same cancer as you. So if you don't mind, just stretch forth your hand. His name is Joel. Joe. Let's believe that the Lord will reveal the purpose for Joe and the purpose will save his life. So Father, we come before you right now and just say, Lord, we thank you for this divine moment. We thank you, Lord, for the faith of this woman to say, I'm coming up. And she took courage to come up here. 
and we break it now off of Joe. Yeah, yeah. Lord, I ask that you give him the same thing that you gave me, and that's a way out. A way out. We plead the blood of Jesus over him. We speak peace and shalom. And sh let their shouts of grace, grace become upon your family. I see that your family has been under a lot of stress. And you almost like your oxygen levels are lower just because of it. You're like, ah, I can't catch my breath. Catch your breath.